And I didn't, if you want to check the, no, I'm good. Um, check the air. I did not turn that down at all, Brandon. Maybe you can look and bump it down depending on the temperature here. And I believe the fan is on and uh, to get some air moving here uh, with it. And sometimes it gets dry in here. If you need a drink or anything, um, we can help you. Uh, we have bottles of water, any of that stuff. Don't be embarrassed. I, I get that every once in a while too. And uh, uh, just ask Brandon, did you drink out of your water? I know I did mine and uh, with it. But uh, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 5. And uh, we're going to look at verses 7 through 11. Uh, not that I'm skipping verse 6. I'm going to come back to it. And uh, I have uh, worked on it for the last couple weeks. And just God has not given me peace to preach on that verse yet. I'm going to come back to it and kind of culminate everything that the Lord has taught. And of course, verse 6 has to do with, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, it seems as if that verse doesn't have anything to do with the previous verses, five verses, but it has everything to do with those five verses. We looked at last week, do we have a responsibility uh, to judge? The Bible says, judge not, lest ye be judged. You hear that verse and that quote, uh, oftentimes that phrase, hey, uh, you don't have any right to judge me. You have no right to be a judge because your Lord uh, and your Bible teaches for you not to judge. They have completely taken that out of context. Uh, we can judge sin. We can judge wrongdoing. You take a look at what's happening uh, in this. You know, I was asked this morning, what did you do to celebrate thus far this week Pride Month? I said, well, I celebrated and I have great pride that I'm a man and I'm not ashamed of it. Uh, I'm going to preach against wickedness. I'm going to preach against sin. I will say this, and uh, we'll get the exact wording of it. Maybe uh, Brother Steve knows. But next week, or this coming week, they are trying to push through legislation in Michigan where it is a five-year prison sentence for me to speak on, preach against homosexuality, the transgender movement, and all of this stuff. It is a minimum of five years in prison for me to preach this. Well, I'm going to preach on it. <laughs> I'm going to tell them you gave me the message and we can bunk together. <laughs> now, let me say this. It has never been on my bucket list to spend a night in jail. It's never been there. Maybe some, it is for you. But I'm sick and tired of them taking their turn and they can say and do anything they want and we can't. We're going to preach against sin. I'll judge that. I'll judge abortion. I'll judge murder, alcohol, all of those things. We have a right biblically to stand up against it. Those verses as we looked at talking about that we can't judge in accordance to uh, where we are uh, as far as in a pharmaceutical or hypocritical, we look at someone else's sins and we judge them, but yet we have sin in our own life. As we looked at, the moat and the beam are made of the same exact material. One's larger, one's smaller, but God looks at sin as sin. Then you jump into verse 6. It has everything to do with that. It has to do with our testimony, our right, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. Understand this. You can never talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and separate the holiness of God, the holiness of the Lord, and talking about Jesus Christ. I've made this statement before. I do not debate people. Hey, preacher, would you debate me on this? Or can, can I talk to you about the NIV? And, and can I talk to you about this? Uh, anytime a translation of the Bible or different things, they'll say, can we talk about it? No, they want to debate. They want to do this. Can we talk about this? I Listen, I don't debate. I do declare the Word of God. 
I will talk to someone who has an open mind and an open ear and say, here's where we get our teaching from. Here's where we get this from. And so we're going to come back to that. What is Jesus saying here when he says not to, to, to give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample under their feet and turn again and render it, rend you. And so we're going to come back to that and really culminate the whole teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to look at a section here in a part of this scripture in verses 7 through 11. It says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom, if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him. Now, this is a very familiar passage of scripture found in the Lord's Supper, the Lord, the Lord's Supper, the Lord, the Sermon on the Mount. We'll get there. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and and so uh, chapters five, six, and seven are all part of this sermon. And so we've already covered prayer back in chapter six. Uh, we we looked at it uh, intensely. And then really looked at the verses that the Lord is talking about, really in verses 8 through 15. And so I want us to look at this again. What is the Lord teaching us on this passage of Scripture? We've looked at the importance of prayer. Now, the Lord understood the importance of prayer, but not only the importance of prayer, but we must understand the power that is in prayer. I believe that prayer opens the windows and doors to heaven. I believe that. I believe that, as it it talks about, I believe in James, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Talks about Elijah praying. He prayed that it would not rain for three years. And finally at the end of time, God said, hey, go tell him that it's going to rain. And so I believe in prayer. I believe in Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Prayer gives us access to God and the power of God. So we will never be any stronger spiritually if we do not spend time with God in prayer. Our prayer and our prayer life literally dictates our spiritual life. Yes, read your Bible, but spend time in prayer. And so prayer, I believe, is the greatest tool that the Christian has. It is through prayer that we make our petitions known to God. It is through prayer that we can come before the throne of God and say, God, here is a need that I have, or here's a request that I'm making for someone else, or Lord, I just want to praise you. I just want to honor you. I just want to give glory to you in prayer. You've heard this expression, seven days without prayer makes one week. Now, seven days is a week, W-E-E-K, but... Seven days without prayer is going to make one W-E-A-K, weak. So I pray that this morning as we look at these verses, it will remind us of the benefits that we have in prayer. The benefits. The thing I love about this, and I'll say it again, do you realize that prayer puts all of us on an even, even playing field? All of us. From the youngest to the oldest, when we go to God in prayer, God hears us and listens to us. God will answer my prayer in a different way than He answers yours, but all of us can get a hold of God. This is what the Lord is saying here. Uh, Take a moment to consider, and maybe you've heard this poem written before. It's an unknown author for it. It says, I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish, I didn't have time to pray. Troubles just tumbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me, I wondered. He answered, you didn't ask. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided. Why, child, you didn't knock. 
I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on gray and bleak. I called on the Lord for the reason. He said, you didn't seek. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take some time and pray. This song or this poem, they say, was written in accordance to Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. I want us to take a few moments this morning and consider these verses. In the three words there in verse 7, and then also in verse 8, Ask, seek, knock. Asketh, seeketh, knocketh. If ye ask, you receive. If you seek, you'll find. If you knock, it'll be opened unto you. Isn't that a tremendous promise to us? And so in this, understand the commitment to prayer. The commitment to prayer. Now here the Lord conveys the need for a committed prayer. He talks about the participation that is involved in prayer here. Ask, and it shall be given you, verse 7, verse 8, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. He says, if you will ask, you will receive. Now, we'll talk about that here for a second. This is a very simple, but also an extremely profound statement. Do you understand we cannot expect God to answer a prayer that we never ask? If we say, why isn't God taking care of this need? Why isn't God answering me? And you say, well, because you never called. It's like, and let me say this, and it's, I want to be careful how I say it. Don't get angry at me that I don't make a call to you in the hospital or in your home if I don't know that you've been in the hospital or that you're sick. Don't get mad at me. Well, pastor never called me. I didn't know you were in the hospital. I didn't know you were sick. We go to God and say, God, why didn't you answer this? And why didn't you take care of this need? And he says, listen, I know everything, but you never asked me. You never came to me and said, listen, Lord, would you help me in this matter? He says, so if you ask, you're going to receive. The participation that is involved, we need to learn to ask the Lord for our needs. Simply take it to the Lord in prayer. You know that God desires to come before Him with our needs in an attitude of faith, believing that He will answer. Listen, why in the world would we go to someone and ask them uh, in prayer, thinking or surmising, I don't know if He can answer this. I don't know if He can take care of this. How many have ever prayed this way? Lord, if you're able to. I have. That's a dumb prayer. We know that God has the ability to. We know that God has the power to. But God says prayer has participation in it. We must go to God in prayer expecting and asking. In James 4.2, he writes, Ye have not because ye what? Ask not. In 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask Anything, now here's the key, according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. I've heard this most of my life. I'm sure you have heard this as well. You have two ears and what? One mouth. If you use your ears twice as much as your mouth, you'll learn some things. My grandfather used to say, and dad would say, that if you'll just sit and listen to someone talk for a few moments, you'll know where their heart is. If you spend some time with God in prayer and Bible reading, you'll learn the heart of God. And so when you go to God in prayer, you will ask it in accordance to His will because you're in tune with God. Have you ever tried to talk to someone who's, who's uh, uh, unsaved? Someone who maybe is a reprobate and, and you're trying to have a wonderful conversation. It is hard to fellowship with someone who is lost or someone who is unsaved unless you're talking about a particular subject. 
But man, when you get together with Christian folks, they may not be from the same church, from the same family, but they're saved and they know the Lord and they're like faith and you can get together and you can just fellowship together while you have kindred spirits. When we spend time with God, we hear from God, we know God. What did Jesus Christ say? I was talking to a man yesterday and he said, you know, in, in, in this day and age, he said, I'm so glad we have the Holy Spirit. Because what did Jesus Christ say? He says, it's imperative that, that I go. He says, and I'll leave you a comforter and he shall guide you in all truth. How do we know what to ask for? When we spend time with God in prayer, when we spend time with God in Bible reading, the Bible says that we will ask in accordance to his will. But we have to go to God and ask for it. We have this confidence, this commitment to prayer. The passion involved here. Seek and ye shall find. Verse 8, he that seeketh findeth. Now this reveals seeking with a purpose of finding. It reveals commitment and a sense of urgency. It presents the idea of seeking diligently for something of great value. It has the idea of going to God saying this is something vitally important. Now we know that God has exactly what we need and He has the ability to provide it for us. So we have committed the keeping of our eternal soul to Him. You know, how many of you believe that once saved, always saved, you can't lose something that you're not holding? So when you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your heart and save you, or you give your life to God and say, Lord, I want you to save me. Take me to heaven when I die. And you know that you cannot lose your salvation. Now, we believe that, but yet we have a hard time believing that God will take care of our needs. Folks, we have to commit our needs to Him. He's the only one that can help us. You look at our day and age. Man, it is getting, it's getting close. It's getting close. When you look at all the bills that are being placed out there and everything that's taken place, this isn't the America that I used to know. This isn't human. It's satanic. The only way to fight Satan is through the Word of God. Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, on the mountain said to Satan, It is written the word of God the word of God was before time it's for eternity and so what do we use we use the word of God many times we lack the confidence in his ability to provide for our everyday needs we must seek the Lord in prayer as if we uh, sought something of great value, fully expecting to find what we need. Listen, we are not, when we go to God in prayer, when we go to God with the need, we ought not be window shopping. Now, what is window shopping? You may see something that you like, something that you want, and you just walk on by it. I believe many times that's the way we look at prayer. We look at God. Are we a window shopper or are we shopping for what God has given to us? God says, I have everything that you need. I have the abilities to provide that need for you. But you have to come to me and you have to ask me for it. And I will give it to you. When you think about the passion involved, when we go to God in prayer, it ought to be with the passion because we are praying to the Holy One, the Yahweh, the great I Am. And we're going before God in His throne room saying, God, I have a need here, I have a desire here. Would you please answer it for me? There ought to be passion in our prayer. Oh, you find passion in the ball games and, and you see passion at sports activities and you see passion in, in, in activities and different things. We ought to have passion when it comes time in prayer. But not only does it require participation and passion, here's the tough one, patience. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. To him that knocketh it shall be opened 
Now we must come to God in prayer, believing through faith until God opens the door for us. How many of you have a, a, a special need? And you don't have to raise your hand. I want you to think about this. You have a special need on your heart that you're bringing before God. How often do you pray for it? Well, I pray every morning for it. Is that all? Or do you pray throughout the day for it? Every time you think about it, do you pray? Why? It is important to you. You bring it to God, but you don't stop. You will pray for that until God answers that special need. It may be one day. It may be two days. It may be a week, a month, a year. It may be years before God answers that prayer request. God has a purpose in delay, but God always answers our prayers. Maybe not always the way we want to. You see, God always rewards the faithful, fervent prayers with fulfillment. Now again, God may not always answer our prayers the way that we desire Him to or expect Him to, but He will always be just and it will always be what we need. How many of you have ever prayed, and I'll say speak for myself, because you know God is, God is so busy, He has so many things on His mind, and so sometimes I have to help Him on telling Him exactly how He ought to answer the prayer. How many of you have ever done that? Oh, y'all sinners, you need to come up to the altar when this is done. You know you have. Hey, God, listen, I have a special need. And if you would just do this, and God says, you foolish person, why don't you just let me answer it? In accordance to my will. God may not always answer in accordance to our expectation, but he always fulfills his promise. He always gives us something better. He always gives us something greater. We may not always get the answer the first time. In fact, He may even deny our request. But remember, when God says no, it's because He has something better for us. God has a greater gift. God has a better answer for us. God says, hey, I know you desired this, and I know you would take a job, for instance, and, and we pray for a job, and, and we think we may have that position, or we may think we have that bonus, or, 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 or that, uh, uh, the, the, that we're promoted, and, and, and God doesn't answer it. We're like, why did you do that to me, God? I've been faithful to you. And God says, because I just have something better for you. And if you would have taken that, you would have missed out on this. So often, God doesn't answer in accordance to our will. He always answers it in accordance to His will. If we will continue to knock, God will eventually open the door of His abundance. You know, I believe this. I believe that sometimes God waits to answer because He wants to know how sincere we are with it. Is it real to you? Does it really mean that much to you? Yeah, we'll go to God and say, hey, God, I have a bill that's, that, that, that is due, and, and here's the due date, and I'm asking you to help me for that. And, and God, I've said this before, uh, seldom is God early, but He's never late. It's always in accordance to His time. But there's some things that I'm praying for, and, and I believe that God's saying, how important is it to you? And I'm just going to stay in my hand for a little while and see if it's real for you. Folks, we must never give up in our prayer. We must continually be patient. But not only the commitment to prayer, but the covenant in prayer. In verse number 8, it says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Again, verse 7, Asking it shall be given you. Seeking it you shall find. Knocking it shall be opened unto you. Verse 8, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now here we find a gracious promise from the Lord concerning our commitment to prayer. Consider the audience here. Now think about this for just a moment. 
Jesus has instructed his disciples to pray to our Father. What's the audience? God and me. Me and God. The two of us. That's the audience. I don't have an audience with a priest. I don't have an audience with a man. I have an audience with the creator of all the world. That's my audience. That's the one that's listening to me. And they were not making their petitions known to some stone idol, some wood statue, a somebody who, who may have lived upon this earth, who was wicked and vile while he was on this earth, and then he has died, and they've made him a, a, a king or made him a god, and that's who we go to and pray. No, we go straight to God, the Heavenly Father, the Creator of all the world. He says, I am the beginning, I'm the end, I'm the first, I'm the last. I'm the great I am. That's our audience. So when we think about prayer here, they were not praying to a God that's limited. They were instructed to pray to the God of heaven. Listen, he cared for them. But not only did he care for them, he had the power and resources to meet their needs. Listen, when you come to me, I'll answer all your needs. I'll answer all of your prayers. Folks, we can be confident when we pray. This great promise relates to us as well. We have the privilege of entering the throne room of God, the very throne room, making our petitions known to God through Christ. We have access to God through Christ. God looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ and he listens to our prayers. Listen to Hebrews 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. We must come boldly to the throne of grace. We don't need to go and say, well, I sure hope you can, you can answer this, God. I sure hope you can take care of this. No, we can boldly go to the throne of grace knowing that God will answer it. Now, again, he may not answer in accordance to my will, but Jesus Christ is saying, listen, when you have a need, take it to God. When you have a desire, take it to God. I believe we ought to pray to God about everything. Well, I don't, I don't need God for everything. We need God for everything in our life. Everything. And so you look at the audience that we have here. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God, one mediator between God and men, that man, Christ Jesus. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I think I've told you this before. I, we took a mission trip. The, the, the missionary, the Hughes family, Jacob and Viola, uh, Jacob went with us to Mexico. We took him down there and, and uh, uh, Brother Porter uh, Wayne Porter was the missionary, and so uh, he could speak fluent Spanish. And so he says, hey, I'm going to have you preach. And, and uh, he says, but I'm not going to interpret for you. He says, I'm actually going to have one of the young ladies uh, uh, here interpret for you. She understands English, uh, the Spanish language much better, but he said she also uh, needs this for training. He says, so if you don't mind, he says, I'm going to have her interpret for you. And that was the first time I ever spoke through an interpreter. And it has went downhill from there anytime I do it. And I started talking and, and, and I started getting messed up. I started getting a little bit confused. And I'm starting to sweat thinking, I hope nobody here understands English. And I sure hope she knows what she's saying. Afterwards, I said, I so apologize. She said, oh, preacher, she said, I took care of it for you. So she wasn't supposed to preach to him, but she did. She says, I corrected the wrongs. I said, that's half the message here. You know, got a few things twisted. You get your words twisted around. But aren't you glad that when we go to God, 
He understands everything. Everything. We may not know what to always say, but our intercessor, the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, knows exactly what we need. And so Jesus is saying, listen, when you go to God in prayer, the audience, but also the abundance here, the Lord teaches that we ask, seek, and knock so that we can receive, find, and have. You see, as we consider to whom we are praying, this provides great comfort. We can have the petitions that we desire of the Lord. We have the promise of the abundance of God's, of, of God, uh, God's being and what He provides for us. We understand that when we go to God, it's not just going to be a little ration. It's going to be a full blessing. What did David say? My cup runneth over. I've been given more than I even asked for. That's why I love the verse in Jeremiah 33, 3, as we just quoted a moment ago. It says, call unto me and I will answer thee and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He says, listen, what you're asking for is so small. Well, boy, do I have a lot to give to you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to make it better and better for you. Why? Because you took time to ask. Because you took time to spend with me. I don't believe that we ought to... You know, it's amazing that when someone gets in trouble or someone's going through a hard time, that's the only time they go to God. Or sometimes the only time that you see them in church. And then as soon as things get, get going good again, they're like, okay, thanks, I'll see you again the next time it gets bad. Folks, I believe that we ought to see him and spend time with him on good days as well as bad days. And when you're having a good day, say, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the beautiful, wonderful day that you've given us. Be able to go out and, and, and maybe water our flowers. Maybe spend time out in the yard and listen to the birds singing and, and, and spend a little bit of downtime with the Lord and say, God, you are so good. You're so wonderful. We have chickens and we let them out for about an hour and a half at night. And every single day night they do the same thing they empty all of the little lava rocks almost from in front of our window of our bedroom they're on the sidewalks my wife said i almost twisted my ankle the other day because those good chickens it was not quite that word she used um wasn't a swear word but she did call them dumb um but i thought about that i said oh why do they do that? I have a broom sitting there. I sweep it in three times a night. But I've not heard one cricket chirping. I'm like, go get them. Because if I sit there in bed and try to sleep and I hear that cricket, I'm going to go out there and empty those lava rocks out too. You know, sometimes we only look at the bad instead of seeing all the good that God has given to us. What is the abundance that God gives us? Because we have the promise of the abundance of God being provided for us in Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. In Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Listen, the child of God has the privilege of prayer backed by the fullness of heaven. I mean, we have everything at our disposal. Am I worried about the future? No. Am I concerned about the future? Yes. But am I trusting in a holy God? Yes. Why? Because God's going to take care of everything. He provides this. You know, many times when bad things happen, we're just finding out what God already knew. How do we respond to it? How do we act upon that? We take a stand. Notice the affirmation here. The availability that Jesus spoke of. He reveals that prayer is not limited to a select or elite group. Everyone that asks can receive. He that seeks can find. To him that knocks, it shall be opened. Now understand, the disciples were not accepted by the Pharisees or the elite religious group. The disciples were not on the who's who list. 
They were hated. They were despised because of Christ. But isn't it good to know that it doesn't matter what the world thinks? It's only what God thinks. Listen, I don't care to be accepted by the world, but I certainly want to be accepted by God. Listen, the world can't answer what I need, but God always can take care of my needs. If it's financial, God can take care of it. If it's spiritual, if it's personal, if it's health, any of those things, God will give us wisdom. God will take care of those needs. Isn't it wonderful to know? You know, few outside our circle of influence may know our name, but we have the assurance of access to the Lord when we pray. Think about this. It is a level playing field, as I mentioned, when we go to God and we go to Calvary. All believers have access to God through prayer, through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad I don't have to depend upon someone else. Now, I will say this. If you have a prayer request, and we take prayer requests on, on Wednesday nights, and we put it on a prayer bulletin, and, and I pray that you take them and pray for them throughout the week. And, and there are some that, uh, not that any prayer request is, is of less value or less importance, but there are some that say, this is time sensitive, and Lord, I'm really begging and pleading that you'll take care of this need. And you bring that before the Lord, knowing that I don't have to say uh, to someone, Gabriel, you're 21 years old now. Uh, Listen, would you go to God and pray for me? Now, it's wonderful to know that someone's praying for me, but I can go to God. I don't have to go to a priest and say, listen, will you get in touch with God? I want to go to someone who I know can get in touch with God, but God says, you don't need to go to him. You can come to me. You can ask me. You know, you don't have to depend upon another. The last thing here is not only the commitment and the covenant, but the confidence. In verses 9 through 11, here we find encouragement to pray in full assurance and confidence. What is the Lord revealing here in verse 9? He says, Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? The illustration here. You you, you look at this. The Lord appeals to the love a father has for his son, that the father has for his child. Jesus knew that anyone in their right mind would take care of their children. Anybody in their right mind. Now, I understand we have a bunch of people in our society that doesn't, and they're not in their right mind. Why? They've been given over to the power of the devil. He's blinded their eyes. But I know the, the, the families in here, and some not as well, but uh, looking at your children and, and, and family, I believe that all of us look at our children and we have the best interest at mind when we deal with our children. Maybe it's discipline, but it's something else. But he, 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 he looks at and he appeals to the love of God. Jesus knew that anyone in their right mind we would not possibly consider giving our children a stone to eat if they were hungry. How many of us have heard our children say, or how many of us have said this? Uh, Now, I realize that us husbands, when we come to our wives and say, hey, what's to eat? She'd like to stone us, I mean, or give us a stone, I know, once in a while. But how many of you, your, your children come to you and say, listen, mom, dad, I'm hungry. Say, well, hey, here's a rock that's sitting on the table. Go ahead and go to your room and eat this. No, we might have fun and say, hey, here's a rock. And, and, uh, uh, but, but we wouldn't do that. Why? Uh, there are some parents that may neglect their children. But those who are right with the Lord will seek to care for them in a loving, responsible way manner. Now, as you think about and consider this illustration, I'm reminded of the dependence of children on their parents. 
Again, the Lord is telling us, and He's telling us to appeal to the love of God. But not just the love of God, the love of the Father. Look back at chapter 6 for just a moment. In verse number 8, it says, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father. So he brings it into a personal, intimate relationship, the Lord Jesus Christ is saying. And so over in chapter 7, it's the same God that we're going to. He's saying, your Father cares about you. Your God cares about you, and He is going to take care of you, and He's got your best interest in mind. And he's saying, I want you to look at this as a father and a parent trying to take care of the needs of their children. You know, small children in particular depend upon their parents for all of their needs. How many agree with that? Some are growing up and graduating from high school and, and, and you look at the young children around here. And some can take care of some needs, but they're dependent upon their parents. Now, Gabriel, I'll pick on you. You're not, although you are right now. You can leave the home. You can get an apartment. You can work your job, and you can take care of your needs. That's not who God's talking about. He's talking about Rosemary. He's talking about Uriah. They're 100% dependent upon their parents, Mitch and Angie, 100%. Their health and well-being is dependent upon you. Little Adeline is dependent upon her parents to make the right decisions for them. And so Uriah and Rosemary come to their parents and say, hey, I'm hungry. And they say, well, here's a piece of, here's, here's a piece of molded bread. Here's, here's something I picked up on the road, and, and, and it probably has a good spotlight. No. That's not what a parent would do. That's not what God does. He's saying, listen, he loves you and he has your best at mind. And so he's going to provide for you exactly what you need. But you got to go to him. You've got to ask him for this. You know, when they are hungry and, and they come to us and they let us know and, and ask for something to eat, they expect us to give them something that is edible and will satisfy their hunger. Now, both Rosemary and Uriah speak. They can say to you, and maybe you've heard this before, Miss Angie and Brother Mitch, I'm hungry. Or on Wednesday night, or that, 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 that I hear Uriah say, we're going home, or we're, we're, we're eating, or we're having pizza, or we're having something. Adeline can't talk. She's learned a couple new words. No. Now, she shook her head before, now it's no. But we know when she's hungry, she lets us know. And I say, well, you know, there's some spoiled milk here. Why don't you have this? This food has been in here for a couple of weeks, but I think it'll do. We know when she's hungry, and what do we do? We give her what is best for her. I think this set of... This, this rack of barbecue ribs would be wonderful for you. At 11 months old, this would be great. Why don't, why don't I give this to you? No. She can't handle that. As newborn babes, these are the sincere milk of the word that she may grow thereby. So you give that baby something that will help them grow. Something that will help them with nourishment. And she may cry and and, and, and throw a fit, and you warm up the bottle, and you give it to her, and her eyes just glow as she grabs that, and she looks at you and smiles, and she's drinking that substance. And we go to God and say, God, we're hungry. And God says, I know exactly what you need. And we can look up at him and smile and grin and say, thank you. 
Thank you. You see the illustration here. They don't worry that we would offer them something that would be dangerous or harmful if they tried to eat it. That's why it makes me sick with what's going on in our country today and, and, and really uh, the destruction of the home and the destruction of children and, and how a society can even think that what has taken place, especially the honor of a whole month given to a wicked, vile, sodomite people, and I don't care if you agree with that or not. The fact is the Bible calls them sodomites. Why don't we make this like one of the countries, I believe Sweden, said it's family month. Let's honor the home. Let's honor the family. But we are going to give our children what is needed. We need to give them the word of God, not just food for the body, but food for the soul. What did Paul say to Timothy? And that from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Why should we teach the Bible? Because it's the only thing that will help us in life. But also it was commanded by God in Deuteronomy to teach our children. You say, well, I just don't want to force religion down. Don't force religion. I agree with you. That would be the worst thing in the world. But won't you let them just eat upon the Word of God? Why don't you let them enjoy the Word of God? Listen, Disney's doing it. I don't think you ought to have Disney in your home. It's wicked. You look at everything that they're trying to push down the throats of our children. Why are they targeting children? Why are they targeting children? Because they know they're susceptible. You use an illustration. You take, uh, you know, and we've got wonderful kids in this, in this church. You take, I go to Caleb. Hey, Caleb, listen. I know that your dad has taught you that all calls bad. But let's go out and grab a burger and a beer. You're going to say, yeah, I don't think so. If I were to ask Brother Scott to go out, your father, he'd say, no, there's someone leaving. It's going to be the pastor. But let me take one of these young, young children. And in time, I could get them to do things that they would never do. That's why it's important to live right and do right in front of them. That's why they're targeting our children because they know they can influence them to do wrong. What do we need to do? We need to stand up against it. We need to call our elected officials and say, you better not vote yes on this. They said that if that bill went before the House right now, it would pass. It's disgusting that these people are even in. Let me say this, it's not a choice, it's a consequence for us taking a, a, a weak stand against wickedness. But God says, if you come to me and ask, I'll give to you. Looking at it as far as a child, the expectation, if ye then be an evil, how know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask Him? Now Jesus reminds us of our fallen nature. He says, <coughs> He reveals that even sinful humans care for their children in a responsible way. He said, listen, He says, in this, this is for... In this passage, he said, If ye then, being evil, know how to do good, uh, to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them? Again, he looks at sinful nature of man. He says, Even you know that you ought to do good to your children. So if you will do good, what will your Father do that has all the resources? He's going to do good to you. See, if we have the desire and ability uh, to provide for our children, how much more can our Heavenly Father provide for us? We've already established His ability and resources, and we ought to pray in full expectation of God meeting our needs. Now, God may not give us all that we ask for, but He will give us what we need. 
That's why it talks about in Galatians. When we go to God in prayer, we ought to say, thank you for providing this for us. You ask your child, hey, I want you to take the trash out to the dumpster. Thank you for doing it. But they hadn't done it yet. They haven't taken the trash out. But you gave them a command to take the trash out and you thanked them for doing it before they ever did it. When we go to God in prayer, we can say, God, here's the need. Here's the petition. Thank you for answering it. See, when we go to God in prayer, we can have the full expectation that God's going to answer it. And so Jesus is saying, listen, when you go to God in prayer, you know that he will answer because if you will give to your son being evil, God will give to us as he is holy. We can take rest and comfort on these promises. Everything that God gives will benefit us as we are drawn closer to him and learn to rely upon him for our needs. I know we joke about pre the preserved and... Eat dessert first. Joe, you're good at that too. If you watch him, he goes to the dessert table. You got to get there first. Get what you need. God might come back. You want to make sure you have dessert in your body first. It's not a long ride, but hey, how many times has your child went and grabbed a cookie and you said, oh, no, 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 no. Supper's almost ready. Hold on to that. We'll eat it later. Why? Because that will fill you up that you don't need, but I got a full course meal for you that you do need. Hey, Mom, can I drink a mouth right before I go to bed? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. That's a great thing about grandchildren. They just load them up and send them home. And then they say, hey, they want to have a sleepover at your place. Oh, that didn't help, did it? You look at, and sometimes God says, no, 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 no. I'm not giving that to you. I will always give you what benefits you. That's the wonderful Father we have, the satisfaction. Look at two words here, and we'll close. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? Jesus describes everything that God gives us as good things. That is not to say that we will always understand what God is doing in our lives. Sometimes the ways of God are hard to understand. What do we do? We just accept them and say, God, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Thus says the Lord in accordance to Isaiah 55. I'm just going to trust you. Romans 8, 28, the Bible says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. Most God would never send anything that would hurt or corrupt his children. Oh, so we need a sense, or do we sense the need to pray? Do we pray as we should? Prayer is a powerful resource, but we must exercise it. We must go to God in prayer and say, God, I need you. Every morning, my wife and I pray, God, please guide us today. Give us strength in this journey. Give us wisdom in everything we face. We pray that portion every single morning. Why? Because he's the only one that can help us throughout the day. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to be a people of prayer. That we can come to you. We're going to see trials and as we already have and special needs. And, and you are able to answer every, every need we have. Every request we have, and not even trials, good things as well, saying, Lord, I have a desire for this. Lord, would you please open the door for this? And, and God will answer in accordance to our goodness, to our, our needs and His goodness. 
with your heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe someone here this morning has never come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe uh, someone here said, uh, Pastor, I've never received the Lord Jesus Christ. I've never put my faith and trust in Him. I've never uh, called Him and made Him my King. Today's the day. If you don't know for sure that if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven, today's the day to settle that. I'd love to talk to you from the Word of God. I won't come down and embarrass you. I won't call you out. But is there anyone this morning say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I don't know for sure that if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I know that the message this morning was mainly to Christians, but the greatest start to a, 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 a fulfilled life is putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no one like that this morning. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? Maybe someone here this morning is going through some things. And you say, Pastor, pray for me. God knows your heart. God knows what it is. Go to God and say, God, please help me meet this need. Of course, we must make sure that our lives are right with God. And if we have iniquity or sin in our life, we need to go to God and ask Him to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in accordance to 1 John 1, 9. Lord, meet with us here these next few moments. We pray in your precious and holy name.